so hi everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for coming. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I will uh, present you a metric learn, a scikit learn compatible package today. So first, a uh, few words about me. My name is uh, William de Vazé. I work uh, at INRIA Lille, which is in fact uh, in uh, Villeneuve d'Ascq. Uh, so it's really next to here. Um, and I work in the Magnet team on the metric learn package uh, with Aurélien Bellet and uh, Nathalie Vauquier. And uh, we also have a partnership with uh, the INRIA Parietal team, which, uh, which, are, uh, which have a lot of Scikit-learn developers. Uh, so I've been uh, working and discussing a bit uh, with them, uh, especially uh, like Olivier Grisel, Gaël Varocco, Alexandre Gramfort, for instance, and other Scikit-learn developers. Uh, and I've done a few contributions to Scikit-learn also. So first, I will uh, introduce you a bit uh, machine learning and how uh, do you do machine learning with scikit-learn. Then I will present you uh, an introduction to metric learning. How does it relate to general machine learning? And then we will see how uh, to use the metric learn package to do metric learning. And uh, yeah. So first, uh, how to do machine learning with scikit-learn. So what is machine learning? Machine learning is the field of computer science that uses statistical techniques to give computer systems the ability to learn, for instance, progressively improve performance on a specific task with data without being explicitly programmed. That's the definition on Wikipedia. So let's take a look at uh, some uh, application examples that you are probably familiar with to understand more what is uh, machine learning. But there's a lot of uh, problems in computer science that you can solve with machine learning, like uh, image recognition, spam detection, playing the game of Go, speech recognition, medical imaging uh, uh, recognition, like cancer recognition, uh, stuff like this, uh, and uh, automatic translation. Also recommendation systems, for instance. Okay. Uh, wait. Yeah. So in Python, um, Scikit-learn is a very famous uh, machine learning library. Uh, it's used by more than uh, 500,000 data scientists daily around the world. It has uh, three, 30k stars on GitHub, more than 1,000 contributors. And there's a lot of uh, machine learning models or estimators uh, inside Scikit-learn, but not only, there are also uh, a lot of uh, routines that you would like to use in machine learning, like uh, cross-validations, grid search, etc., mm -hmm. that I will detail. Uh, there's a very detailed documentation, so in fact you can learn to do machine learning by just using scikit-learn and going on the documentation. And uh, is it okay? Uh, or okay. Let's see. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you. Do Do you hear me better? Okay. Um, <coughs> and so, just for you to know, the version uh, zero dot. <laughs> 0.20 was released just a few days ago. Let's take a look at uh, a simple example to understand better. So let's say we want to recognize faces. Uh, we have a bunch of uh, faces from our friends and uh, when a new picture comes, we want a machine learning system to, to classify the, the new image. So here uh, we want the, our application or the system to say, oh, this, this one is Cooper, okay. So how do you do it with scikit-learn? First, you have to load the data set. So hopefully in scikit-learn, uh, the, the pictures I showed you are pre-built, so you can just load them uh, with uh, importing uh, the, the data set. So, okay. Is it okay if I uh, take it out or? Ah, ah, okay. okay. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so, what is this data set? It's uh, 400 images of uh, 64 by 64 pixels uh, in a grayscale. Uh, in a grayscale. Uh, so here, I, I just uh, downloaded some random names on the internet to so that it's easier to understand uh, what are the labels. So, and I will call X. The, the data and uh, why the targets, the name of uh, the people we want to classify. Okay, so, and here we will print them uh, and we see that 
X is in fact a 2D array where the first dimension has 400 components. Um, so uh, 400 lines, sorry, and on the on the, cor the um, columns there are uh, 4,096 uh, columns, which are which each represent one pixel. So because there are 64 uh, times 64 uh, pixels, so you just flat flatten uh, your uh, array of uh, pixels. Okay. So and each line is a uh, is one person, and then uh, the Y or the name of the person. So remember, the task was to classify a new upcoming picture. So what you will do is you will uh, train, uh, split your data between train and test so that you can train a model on some training data. And uh, you just keep aside a test set that will represent the new upcoming data that you have never seen before and you want, that you want to, to classify. Okay, so here we see that the train set has uh, 300 examples and the test set 100 examples. And what you will do uh, then is to train the classifier. So here I represented the points uh, in, uh, in a 2D space so that you can visualize it, but uh, you have to imagine that they can be in a, like a very high dimensional space. So here uh, it would be a 4096 uh, dimensional space. And here we will learn the logistic regression, but we could have learned any other model, uh, almost any uh, other model. Uh, and what's really cool with scikit-learn is that uh, the, API, the API of every model is the same, so you just have to, they can be interchanged uh, as you want. Uh, you can change uh, the model as you want. Okay, so here the logistic regression will try to separate uh, the different points. So here, uh, let's say red represents uh, John. So a uh, logistic regression will just, we'll just learn a hyperplane that uh, separates in the, in the space the different uh, faces. And once you have learned it, you can, when a new sample comes, okay, you, you, just, uh, you already have, the, have learned the frontier, so you say, okay, uh, this new sample is uh, in the purple frontier, so I will say, okay, it's probably, uh, it's probably Mark, because uh, purple represents Mark. And with scikit-learn, it's really easy to do that. We, you, can, uh, you can do the predict function. And here, we, if we predict uh, every picture that is in the test set, we see that uh, there's a prediction. But right now, we don't really know uh, if this is uh, the good ones, the good names or not. So what you can do to evaluate your model is to use the function score. Uh, by default, for classification, it will uh, use the accuracy, so it will just count the, the percentage of uh, correctly classified uh, images. So here we have uh, correctly classified 91% of the incoming images. But then, uh, there are, in scikit-learn there are uh, good default parameters, but in fact you have to put some, sometimes some parameters uh, into the estimators and have to find the right values for them. So how do you do it? In fact you will uh, Try them and uh, score, and see, and just take the estimator that has the best score. But what you have to keep in mind is you cannot use the test set to score uh, when you do that because the test set is something you keep aside from, and you cannot uh, train on it. And selecting hyperparameters is a kind of training because you will make a choice based on some data. So that's why you have to create a validation set uh, from your train set. So you will have a train, a BIS train set and a validation set. Um, and then for each estimator, you will fit on the train set and score on the validation set. And here we see that we would like to, to choose uh, the, the second classifier with C equal one. But in fact, in practice, you don't do that. You, you would use the, the scikit-learn uh, grid search cross-validation uh, function. Um, which uh, makes it very easy to test a whole bunch of different parameters. And uh, it works like this, you, you would just create a grid of uh, different values for uh, each, par each hyperparameters, each value that you want to test, and then you instantiate a grid search object, and uh, you can fit it. And then uh, it's like a, a meta-estimator, so it's like an estimator, 
but it will have a lot of uh, attributes that you can uh, see after, like uh, what are the best parameters that I have found, uh, uh, the best score, etc. So here, uh, for instance, four, four set of parameters will be tested because it's every combination of, uh, of hyperparameters. And we see that the best one is uh, to take C equals uh, five and to have a penalty uh, L2, for instance. And the score of this uh, estimator was 96% uh, accuracy. And in fact, it does a uh, it doesn't do really the, the train and validation split, as I said before. It does a lot of them uh, with different, uh, like different validation set and different train set in a procedure called cross validation, and it allows to have better estimates for estimating the score of the estimators. All right. So, if anything is unclear, uh, please stop me. But. Uh, now that you have seen uh, how to use scikit-learn to do uh, machine learning, uh, I will introduce you metric learning, which are algorithms that are uh, a bit different. Uh, it, it's a subfield of machine learning, but uh, we will see that they don't take the same input uh, sometimes. Let's take an, an illustrating example. Uh, let's say you want to build a system to grant access to people in a building. Uh, so you have a few pictures of each person uh, in the organization, in the building. Uh, and what you also have is a huge data set of unlabeled images. Because, so the, yeah, okay, no. Uh, a few, uh, huge data set of unlabeled images that, for instance, you found on the internet, or something like this. Um, and, yeah, you, you keep this in a database and the thing is, uh, you will ask Mechanical Turks to uh, label, not images, but pair of images as, is it the same person or are they a different person? And why do you do that? Because in, in practice, you cannot, you cannot ask uh, Mechanical Turks, so there, these are people that are uh, paid to do like very basic tasks. You cannot ask uh, uh, someone uh, with a picture of some people, who is this? Because uh, like, uh, I don't know, if I see a random uh, people, I will not be able to, to find his name uh, like this. So, okay, and we will see how we can use this information to, in fact, uh, make the system we want to, to do. So, what we will, in fact, uh, try to do is to learn a metric between different faces, different images of faces, that will put points that are similar close together, so images that are similar close together, and by similar I mean they represent the same person, and that will put uh, images of people that uh, are different person far away from each other, so with a large distance. And that is why you use metric learning, that's what metric learning does, in fact. And uh, metric learning is able in this case to uh, use the, the information about pairs uh, that have been labeled as similar or dissimilar in order to learn this metric. Okay, if this is not clear, uh, can I stop me? Uh, and okay, so we had a look at an example, but there are, once you have learned a metric like this, there are lots of stuff you can do afterwards. Uh, okay, so for instance, you can uh, you can recommend similar images. Uh, you can uh, group pictures together by uh, so yeah, you can group pictures of the same person together, uh, which allows you, for instance, to un unlock a phone because with the Face ID system, for instance, uh, you can. Uh, compare your new upcoming face to uh, a, a bunch of faces that you have uh, taken when you buy your phone, for instance. Okay, you can, uh, you can also do um, metric learning for uh, document retrieval, for instance, uh, if you want to find a, a jurisdiction document that is uh, similar to another one in a huge database, then uh, 
you can use metric learning. So let's go, come back to our example and see how, uh, so how is the data? Because, right, we want to do it in Python and uh, we want to know how is the data. Uh, so we, in fact, this uh, data set is already existing in uh, scikit-learn, so you can just uh, load it. It's the label face in the wild data set. So uh, here I represented uh, one, the first, uh, here it's zero, so it's the first uh, pair that you have in the data set. You see there are two images of the same guy and the label, okay, here it's not a string saying uh, same person, but it's one, okay? And you have like this a lot of pairs. So that is the, the data set you will train uh, on. And uh, if we print it like uh, in the array like, you see that now the X is a 3D array. So that is very important to understand. It's, a, it's not anymore a 2D array with uh, n samples lines and n features columns. It's a 3D array with n samples lines. Then the second dimension is two because they are pairs. And the third dimension is and features uh, components. And uh, the labels are one and minus one. Uh, so minus one is for dissimilar pairs. So as before, uh, when we were using scikit-learn, we have to split <coughs> the data set between train and test set. Uh, we, and uh, in fact, we can use the scikit-learn function train test split in this case because uh, train test split only looks at the first dimension. It will just say, okay, uh, I will slice the, tr the, the input uh, along the first dimension. So here it will work. It will return this, this array. Uh, so, yeah. Now, uh, the question is how do you learn uh, from this data and I will uh, show you uh, 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 an example of a concrete algorithm which does it, which is a Malanobis metric for clustering. Malanobis metric for clustering uh, will learn a transformation matrix that will transform the input uh, samples, so in this case images, uh, like a vector. Uh, in, uh, so in this case yeah, I didn't see it, uh, I didn't say it, but there are uh, okay, I, uh, I, I don't remember exactly the dimension, but it's al also uh, also a flattened vector of the image. But yeah, so it will transform this uh, vector into a new vector uh, with a linear transformation. So how do you do it in, uh, in uh, mathematics? You just take the transformation matrix, matrix and you multiply it by uh, the, the components, the vector. Uh, and okay, but uh, what what is this new space? What is what are these new uh, new vectors? You want them to be uh, like to define a metric that is uh, good for your task. So here, w the the metric associated is simply the Euclidean distance in the new space. Okay, so it's the norm of the difference of the the transformation, the the points transformation. And what the what problem you will solve is you will minimize the sum of the distances in the new space between points that are that have been labeled by the mechanical torque as similar, and you will uh, uh, you will uh, ensure that the distance between the points that have been labeled as dissimilar in the new space is superior to a certain value, and this will. Uh, allow, uh, because if we, you only have the, the term for minimizing uh, the distances, then you would have, uh, all your points could collapse on one point and yeah, you would have minimized the distances uh, between every point and including the points that are similar. So what you want to do not to have that is, and also to, to put apart points that are far away from each other. So that's why there's a second term, you have to Ensure that uh, the sum of different, the sum of distances between uh, different points is uh, superior to to a constant. Here we will take one. Okay. 
And then, uh, as I said, uh, in the applications uh, of metric learning slides, you can do a lot of stuff. You can do k nearest neighbors classification with this metric. You can do clustering. So that's also an important point because often when you do clustering, you you don't really know, uh, you, you don't give uh, information because it's an unsuper like uh, most of times you say it's an unsupervised technique, so I just have my data, I want to cluster it into a bunch of points. Um, and the thing is, often it doesn't uh, cluster as you want. Uh, for instance, in my case, if I didn't put information, it could have clustered points uh, that have the same uh, face orientation together, for instance, and that's not what I want. So this uh, um, metric learning allows you to give uh, some information that can be used for clustering. Okay, so if anything is unclear for now, you uh, can ask me. But now we will see how to use the metric learn package uh, because we only saw how to load the data in Python and uh, what is a concrete example of an algorithm, but we don't know how we use uh, the, the metric learn package. So an introduction about the package, it was created uh, by CJ Carey and uh, Yuan Tang. Uh, it has 472 stars on GitHub, nine algorithms, uh, some documentations, and uh, right now there have been 13 contributors. Uh, so here are the contributors on GitHub that you can see by uh, line addition, but of course there are also other contributors with discussions, uh, comments, uh, issues, etc. So, uh, and also to, to note, uh, Metric Learn, the last version, 0 0.4.0, was just released uh, one month ago. But it's not yet compatible with Scikit-Learn. And uh, in the rest of the talk, I will explain to you how uh, to make it compatible with Scikit-Learn. And how will we be able uh, in version 0 0.5 to train, uh, to do cross-validation? So train is already possible, but to do cross-validation, to do grid search, etc. Uh, yeah, that's the challenge. So remember the data we had after splitting was like this, represented by uh, 3D arrays. Um, so, in fact, in version uh, 0 0.5.0, this format will be accepted because this format is very simple, uh, very simple to understand, and uh, it, it works out of the box. You, you will be able to instantiate uh, MMC, the MMC algorithm, um, define a grid for some hyperparameter, and uh, uh, create a grid search CV object like in scikit-learn and uh, fit the, the grid search. So, and why does it work? It's because, in fact, cross-validation routines and grid search, they only look at the first dimension. They will, on, they, will only, they will only split on the first dimension, so the splits are still uh, learnable, like they are still uh, valid input data. It's, it's, uh, I mean, it's the right slicing, so this will work. In, in the next version. But this has a problem. It's that uh, in metric learning, you have these data sets. And um, you saw before, I will, yeah, that here, for instance, this, this point is replicated two times because it is involved in two pairs. And in practice, points can be involved in a lot of pairs, in thousands of pairs. And when there are high dimensional points like images, this makes a representation. Okay, sorry. Okay, sorry. This makes a representation of the data that is uh, very, very big, and it, it can blow up your memory. Okay, so there's there will be also another uh, way to give the data to metric learning estimators in the next version. It's uh, by 2D arrays of indices. So as represented here, instead of having a 3D array of uh, really the vectors. Uh, uh, you will just have a 2D array of indices and then, of course, you have to give uh, on the other side to the estimator the, the data set in which you want to pick, to pick the samples based on the indices. So 
Here you just give this to the estimator and uh, the, the data set is given at the beginning at initialization but then when you, f you fit on the train set, the estimator will say, okay, the first pair is the zero sample and the third sampled, so I will go to take them, f uh, create the pair, it's similar, so, and it will train like this. And the only thing that changed here is that you will, uh, so there are two things that change. First, the, what you put in fit, in fit is not anymore uh, just pairs, it's the pairs uh, indices and you have to give at the beginning uh, the, um, the data into a preprocessor argument. Okay. Uh, but you will not only be able to do it with the uh, indices, you can also you will also be able to do it with uh, any kind of of object that is an indicator uh, of uh, the data. So here we can have strings uh, to represent, uh, so instead of indices, so here it's still a very low memory consumption, uh, it's just, just a string, and in this case, instead of putting the data into the preprocessor, you will put a callable that will uh, go to, that take as an input these uh, identifiers and go to fetch uh, the, uh, the the data. So what the callable must return is uh, a 3D array, as we saw before. And in fact, in fact, um, this r allows to reduce the memory consumption. Um, but y there's still a point that I didn't say to you is that if you do this and inside the the algorithm inside the code then someone goes to fetch the, the whole 3D array, then it will be the same problem as before. It will create a big array that will blow up the memory. So in fact, what algorithms will do is to fetch indices per batch, per small, uh, uh, sorry, fetch data from indices per batch. So you will have uh, the, the, three, the, the, the first uh, 10 examples, t uh, 10 uh, indices, 10 pair of indices and uh, the preprocessor will form a 3D array that have uh, 10 lines, for instance. And this will be used to update uh, some computation. For instance, if you want to compute a gradient, uh, it will be used to update it. Okay, now I will just give you a quick overview of uh, the package. So, you don't have to read all this. It's just to tell you that there are, uh, like, at the bottom you can see that there are uh, the algorithms, uh, and I will go into more details. You will understand better here. So, uh, first, uh, there are all different types of algorithms for metric learning. We only saw Malanobis metric for clustering in the case where you have labeled pairs, but there are also other stuff. So first, there are some fully supervised metric learning algorithms that uh, work um, as a regular, so here for them as regular transformers from scikit-learn, uh, like neighborhood component analysis, uh, large margin nearest neighbors, uh, LFGA, uh, co covariance. So covariance is a more toy, uh, uh, machine, uh, toy algorithm, but it's uh, still uh, useful. And um, so this will take, as before, uh, input points like X, uh, input data that is labeled with uh, like a class. And uh, the metric that they will learn is a metric that puts closer points that have the same class and put far away from each other points that have a different class. Okay. Uh, there is also, in a supervised fashion, MLKR, metric learning for kernel regression. So this algorithm will uh, put closer together that have the same target value. So in regression, the, the Y is a continuous uh, value, for instance. So they will put closer together that have the same value. Um, and that can be useful, for instance, if you use the kernel, uh, uh, kernel regression 
of scikit-learn. Uh, like a, it's a bit like a k nearest neighbors, uh, but for regression, it, it can improve uh, the the performance. Uh, there, but okay. So there are also the weakly supervised algorithms, and these are the ones that are kind of original and uh, really specific to metric learning. Uh, so there are pairs of algorithms that, like the one I presented you, Malanobis metric for clustering. There's also ITML, SDML. But um, there, you can also learn on quadruplets instead of pairs. And uh, uh, I will explain you after uh, how does it work. But you also have to remember that uh, every weekly supervised, when I say weekly supervised, I, it's because they don't work on uh, X and Y. It's they, they learn on, uh, on pairs or quadruplets, for instance. So every weekly supervised algorithm comes with a supervised version that is kind of a wrapper that will on the fly, based on uh, X and Y, uh, will create pairs so uh, pairs uh, of similar samples and pairs of dissimilar samples or they can even create quadruplets as i will explain uh, after but um, yeah if you if you really want to use uh, mmc but you have uh, labeled data which is cool because there is more information you can still use it because uh, there's the supervised version so yeah just a quick uh, point about how to learn with quadruplets so instead of saying Okay, these two samples are similar, or these two samples are dissimilar. You can say instead, sample A is more similar to sample B than C is to D. So it's a different kind of supervision. It's weaker uh, because you don't force you don't force a distance between samples to be small and or big. You just say it has to be smaller or bigger than another distance. And uh, yeah, it's it's also also interesting. Uh, uh, first, if you have uh, this type of data set, then you can use it. But even uh, you can also cast different problems uh, this way and uh, try to see if you have different results. In yeah. So here, uh, here is a, a sub diagram of the weekly supervised learners. Uh, so as w as I said, every uh, weekly supervised algorithm has a supervised version. They both inherit from a base, uh, uh, base uh, class. And uh, weekly super each weekly uh, supervised method inherits from uh, uh, <coughs> like a, a mixing for pairs, for instance, or mixing for quadruplets classifiers, which uh, in, in turn uh, inherit from a base class for metric learners. And so in this slide, you see there is uh, the predict and the score function that are defined uh, at the meta level from the uh, algorithm because they will be the most, uh, it can be overwritten, but most of times it will be the same way you will score uh, every pair classifier, uh, etc. So uh, how do you score uh, in the context of metric learning? So first, uh, it's not uh, okay. So first, every metric learner has to have a score pairs method because this is the basic stuff you can do with metric learning. Is uh, you take two instances and it has to learn a metric, so it has to give you a metric, so a similarity or a distance between these two points. So this is the score pairs function. Now for pairs learner, you will use this uh, this function. Scorpers to to do a predict, so it uses a threshold. For instance, uh, you you can fix a you will be able to fix a threshold and say uh, if my score if my similarity score between two samples is uh, very high, these are very close together, so I will predict one because uh, okay they are similar samples, and uh, if uh, it's not, then I will predict uh, minus one and. Like this, we, thanks to this predict, you can benefit from all uh, scikit-learn uh, functions that uh, work on classifications, for instance, like accuracy, uh, rock AUC, uh, etc. So you will be also be able to use these uh, 
these functions because the okay I j uh, just in the code the, the score function is implemented and uh, it just comp uh, as I said it will just uh, compared to the threshold, but then when the score method uh, is implemented, then you can... Uh no, sorry, sorry. I uh <laughs> okay. Yeah, w when you can do prediction, you, you can do uh, accuracy scoring. And that's it. And for quadruplets, uh, the, score, the, the prediction is done this way. You will say uh, 1 if a, so you will have input data which are instead of pairs are quadruplets so the second dimension of the 3D array for instance will be 4 and uh, if they, are, they arrive in the right ordering meaning the first one is uh, more similar to the second one than the third one is to the first one then uh, you will predict minus 1 and if it's not uh, you will uh, if it's not you will predict minus 1 and if it is you will predict 1 okay and also, as you can uh, predict plus one or minus one, you, you can benefit from, uh, from cyclic-learn uh, functions to, to do uh, all types of scoring. Now, um, all metric learning algorithms right now in the package are Mahalanobis, uh, learn the Mahalanobis matrix. I will explain what it is. Uh, but th that's why there is a, a mixing for that. So what I think is really cool uh, in Python is that uh, there is a multiple inheritance. So in fact, you can create mixings that kind of represent some mathematical properties of uh, estimators, and it helps. Re it really helps to organize uh, the different estimators and create new ones uh, that inherit from properties of uh, others, etc. So uh, my Lanobis. Uh, Metric learning algorithm is the one that learns a linear uh, transformation of the input uh, space. So, as I explained with MMC. Uh, okay, so this means that they all have a transform function. Uh, I didn't explain it when I was speaking about scikit-learn, but uh, there is the transform. Uh, so there are transformers algorithm that uh, are able to transform points into an embedding space and this is what uh, so all, all metric learning algorithm in uh, metric learn will be able to, to do it and they can they will also be able to do dimensionality reductions uh, so I will not go into details uh, about this but it, it will be possible okay now uh, I will just uh, talk a little bit about uh, testing uh, in the context of metric learn but um, I think it applies to machine learning uh, or even numerical uh, scientific computing in Python and I, I like this topic so the, the problem when you test uh, for instance a metric learning algorithm or machine learning algorithm is that you don't know in advance what you want to test because when you want to test uh, some algorithm that will sort a list, you can give a, a fake list, like a toy example of a list, <coughs> and you know in advance that uh, the list has to be ordered in uh, this way. You can, so you can specify it and uh, test if it's uh, true or false uh, in the end. But in uh, machine learning, you can have uh, algorithms that have several uh, optimas uh, and they're all okay, like uh, they're all possible solutions and you don't know in advance uh, what, what is the, the, the minima it will go into. Uh, or it's more a fuzzy thing, so. But hopefully what you can do is to test some properties of uh, the results that you expect. So here are some examples. For instance, what wha uh, something that is uh, really useful is uh, when you want to implement a new algorithm that has a, that computes a gradient. You can, uh, in fact, check that the gradient is correct uh, based on its finite approximation. 
So it's another way of kind of computing the gradient, which is approximate. And this is uh, pre-built in uh, SciPy, the SciPy library. So this is really useful. For another example is that if you want to test that the transformation is indeed linear, is that you will start with some examples that are a linear combination of uh, uh, starting examples, uh, starting uh, samples, and you will just test that uh, in the end they verify the linear uh, equality. Okay, so you can uh, use toy examples, and I will go more in details about this. Toy examples are simple examples that exhibit a property that you can test. And uh, here is an example for Malanobis metrics for clustering, MMC. For instance, you can, you can uh, put three points in a space and you say, okay, I want to label these two points as being dissimilar and these two points as being similar. But at the starting point, they, are, they, they don't respect this because you see this distance here is smaller than this distance here. But however, I say this is a toy example because you know in advance that there exists a linear transformation that will be able to put these two points closer and these two points further. Uh, why? Because you can just rescale the axis, uh, which is a linear transformation of the space, and uh, it will give you the result you want. So here is how you test it. You, you, and one thing that is important is that in the end, you will not test hard values of the, the coordinates of the points. You will just state, test the ranking of distances. So. Of course, it's more difficult to really test, but because uh, you, there are lots of stuff that you, you don't test here, but still, doing a lot of toy examples like this, you can uh, prevent a lot of mistakes, prevent a lot of bugs. So as a quick uh, recap of uh, metric learn, uh, what will happen in, the, in version 0 0.5.0 is that you will be able to be compatible with scikit-learn to do cross-validation, to do grid search, etc. Uh, and do it in a memory efficient way with a preprocessor agreement. The next steps are to submit to scikit-learn contrib. So scikit-learn contrib uh, is uh, an organization on GitHub that hosts a uh, lot of uh, scikit-learn compatible packages and so there are some requirements uh, of uh, quality of course, compatibility with scikit-learn, so a lot of tests uh, that have to pass, uh, like specialized uh, scikit-learn tests. Uh, and oh, okay, so that that would give some more visibility to the project, and uh, yeah. So also other uh, other stuff on the on the next steps are stochastic optimizers. Optimizers. So right now, a lot of uh, algorithms use SciPy algorithms uh, for optimizing, uh, for instance, matrices, uh, the, for instance, parameters that you want to learn. So, but they use a full, uh, like optimizer that compute the full gradient on all the samples. So. For instance, if you know about uh, stochastic gradient descent, it's, it's uh, an algorithm that only uh, only works on batches uh, of samples and does one iteration uh, by computing a gradient on some samples and on some batch of samples and then uh, do it like this. So it will allow to be more scalable also. Uh, because it's, it not only is, doesn't blow up the memory, but it also can converge faster. Because the, the, the preprocessor stuff uh, does uh, like prevents for blowing the memory, but uh, still uh, it could take a long time to process every sample to compute a gradient and then just do one iteration, etc. So this will also allow to be quicker. Um, then I uh, would like to give more choices uh, to form pairs or quadruplets, or quadruplets from labeled data. So right now uh, it's very naive. We just uh, see some labeled data and uh, we just say, okay, we want to form uh, all the possible pairs. So if you have uh, five images from uh, one class, you will create 25 pairs. Uh, and then uh, you can uh, select to just keep a few samples, but maybe we can be more intelligent by uh, only creating pairs that uh, have a useful information. Uh, okay, but 
okay, we want to add uh, more general functions like regularizers, uh, more testing, of course, uh, there can never be too much testing and documentation, a lot more documentation. So as a conclusion, metric learn is a very, a metric learning is a, an original way, uh, an, uh, an original subset of uh, machine learning, which is uh, very useful when you want to learn similarities uh, and when you have, uh, it can be, it's, it's, it's useful when you have uh, weekly supervised information there, and there are many use cases about it. There's the metric learn package to do it, which is open source and uh, in the next version there will be secure learn compatibility. So yeah, you can check it out, it's uh, open source, you can raise issues, submit uh, peers, uh, discuss on GitHub, uh, so, and any contribution is uh, very welcome. So that's it for me. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And do you have any questions? Okay, so we have a few minutes of questions. Okay, yes. Um, okay. I work in a company that already use uh, metric learning uh, to find similar articles uh, okay. from the web. And uh, we use the NCA yeah. um, with uh, supervised mover distance. I don't know if you, if you know good and yeah. one issue that we face is uh, that uh, training it takes a lot of times and uh, I would like to know if um, you consider parallelization of, of some part of the of algorithm if e and if it's possible to parallelize uh, yes somebody. so, so repeat the question somewhere. okay so the question was uh, uh, that you have a problem where you use one particular metric learning algorithm, NCA. Large, and very, very large uh, uh, okay. basis of, uh, of, uh, of, of documents. Okay. Is uh, uh, more than a uh, thousand. Uh, okay. So on a very large database of documents, uh, more than thousands, and you want to uh, know if it's parallelizable. Yeah. So uh, that's a good question. Uh, and NCA, uh, I've been working uh, on NCA at the beginning of uh, my contract. So uh, first of all, uh, the what you can do is use NumPy uh, multiplications. That's and and be and ensure that it is uh, all your computations are vectorized so that there's a parallelism for like to be really faster. So that's the first thing. Uh, for instance, NCA now I can run it uh, on images. Uh, maybe not a huge database, but uh, it's still really, really faster than uh, that what was uh, at the beginning uh, in metric lunch, for instance. Uh, thanks to this, uh, the use of NumPy, uh, because it, on a cluster it will, no, not a cluster, but on a, on a machine that has a lot of cores, it will use all the cores to do matrix multiplication. But then now you talk about, um, so I think there, there will also be the problem of uh, memory, uh, maybe. Uh, so uh, maybe the, the preprocessor option would be something that you could use to avoid the, uh, to form, uh, to have in memory all the, the similarities, uh, sorry, all the, the pairs, for instance. Uh, and yeah, parallelizing uh, to different <coughs> clusters, etc. Uh, so with, with scikit-learn, for instance, what there is, uh, but people will correct me if I'm wrong, is uh, you can use a, for instance, uh, different backends uh, that like Dask or yeah, like a, a Dask, which is another library that allows to do parallel uh, processing. And there's, a, for instance, Dask ML also that uh, records a secular algorithm that can allow to do machine learning uh, on different clusters and on uh, yeah, different machines. So, and the requirement, uh, like uh, maybe it's a very big maybe, but. Uh, NCA algorithm is quite simple, so it could be easily coded in Dask, maybe. So, yeah. You have time for one last question? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have a very basic question. Yeah. You said that you can apply these two cases like problems like document retrieval. Yeah. So can you explain in very simple terms? Yeah. Why would I want to do that instead of like some other classic techniques of like transforming the documents into a vector in some way? 
and then yeah. apply cosine similarity or other techniques. In that case, I will have a pairwise similarity score for each pair of documents. I can yeah. group them together via word clustering or others yeah. and have groups of similar documents. So I'm sure that this is yeah, yeah. another thing. It's just I'm trying to yeah. understand the... So that's a good uh, question. So, OK, the question was... Uh, how does it compare, for, for instance, uh, for document similarity, uh, documents retrieval, how does it compare, how does metric learning compare to other techniques that, uh, like, I guess you were talking about embedding techniques that will uh, embed yeah. do documents in yeah, some I space. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. So, uh, so first, there are, you can do some basic uh, similarity by, uh, with no machine learning, indeed, with uh, TF-IDF, etc. But uh, sometimes uh, it would not give you some good, really good results. That's why some people use it. Because the, the initial metric is not really good. That's why people will try sometimes to embed documents in a space uh, that is uh, m more, uh, that is uh, that has more information. Uh, it can be unsupervised or supervised, like with deep learning te techniques, etc. But so and yeah, uh, th this would compare maybe to the supervised algorithm in metric learn that are ways to embed points uh, in a space based on some labeled information, for instance. But where metric learning is very, very useful is when you, you don't have uh, labels and you don't want to do unsupervised learning because it's, uh, it will not give you what you want. Like, uh, And in this case, when you have labels on the pairs or on the quadruplets, or, and this is stuff that is easier to ask to mechanical trucks uh, so in this case, you would like to use a metric, learn metric learning. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Well, thank okay. you. Let's. Thank you.